Good afternoon. Welcome to UCSF Medical Grand Rounds. I'm Bob Walker, Chair of the Department of Medicine. Uh, we normally take July and August off for Grand Rounds, and when we decided to do that in June, it didn't seem crazy. Uh, as far as COVID stood, on June 1st, San Francisco was running about 10 cases a day. Today, that number is 250. At UCSF, we had one COVID patient in the hospital, never quite hit zero, but got down to one. Today, that number is 41. Uh, and on June 1st, the Delta variant made up 3% of the cases in the United States, and now it's more than 90%. So uh, as they say, backed by popular demand, unfortunately, uh, we felt uh, a, a need to uh, build in the special session uh, to talk about where we are in the pandemic and uh, talk about the current surge, the Delta variant, vaccines, boosters, and more. We didn't think we could fit it into 60 minutes, so we will go 75 uh, minutes. And uh, really pleased to have uh, two of our favorite speakers, both who've been here, who've been with us in the past uh, and have uh, uh, two really important lenses on some of the key issues in the pandemic. Uh, they are Shane Crotty, who's professor at the Center for Infectious Diseases and Vaccine Research at the La Jolla Institute for Immunology. Uh, Shane's lab studies new vaccine ideas and strategies that are applicable to many diseases based on uh, the fundamental understanding of the immune response. Uh, Shane received his PhD in molecular biology and virology from UCSF, so he's a proud product of our system. Welcome back. Uh, our other guest is Carlos Del Rio. Carlos is Executive Associate Dean uh, for Emory at the Grady Health System and Professor of Medicine in the Division of Infectious Diseases at Emory. He's also a Professor of Global Health in the Department of Global Health and Professor of Epidemiology at the Rollins School of Public Health. Carlos, you must have a humongous business card. Uh, he serves as the co-director for the Emory Center for AIDS Research and co-PI of the Emory CDC HIV Clinical Trials Unit. Uh, and he's really emerged as one of the nation's go-to experts on the pandemic, uh, public health aspects, epidemiology, clinical care, and uh, is really very wise about, uh, about all matters uh, COVID. So I thought that the combo of Shane and Carlos would really be perfect as we explore uh, the various uh, parts of the pandemic that we are grappling with. Our format uh, will be that both uh, Shane and uh, Carlos will each speak for about 15 minutes uh, and we'll go quickly through a whole lot of new data, which is emerging even as we speak. Uh, and then at the end of that, we'll have our Q&A discussion uh, with me and, the, and both of them that will go for probably a half hour or so. Uh, we will take your questions. My colleague, Quinny Cheng, will be monitoring the Q&A box. So if you have them, please type them into the Q&A box. Uh, other ground rules are up here, uh, Zoom window in full screen mode. I'll get to as many questions as I can. The session is being recorded and will be posted on YouTube tonight at about 7 p.m. And prior episodes in our series have uh, received over 2 million views. Um, just in terms of advanced planning, I think this will be the last session this month, although we'll see how things go. We'll start back up with our regular Grand Round series on the first Thursday after Labor Day. I think that's September 9th. And it will also be a COVID update, uh, this one with our uh, UCSF threesome of Monica Gandhi, Peter Chin Hong, and George Rutherford uh, will then toggle into our regular grand rounds, which will be a mixture of non-COVID and COVID topics. Right now, COVID topics being planned for the first Thursday of every month for the foreseeable future, hopefully not forever. So with that, let me turn, uh, turn things over to Shane to talk a little bit about the virology and immunology and the variants. Shane, welcome. Thanks, Bob. Yeah, so there's been there's been a tsunami of information on on Delta, and all kinds of different aspects of Delta. Uh, it used to seem like it was monthly changes, then weekly changes, then daily changes, and then now you know there's been changes even between this morning and now. Um, <clears throat> so what I'm going to do is uh, start with. Uh, where I think we're on pretty firm ground, things I think we understand pretty well, and then work towards more into the areas of, of uncertainty, even though those areas of uncertainty are, are some of the areas where we have the, the biggest questions, okay? Um, and, and starting from things that have certainly changed during the summer um, that are relevant. So our understanding of the durability of vaccine immunity and immune memory, um, what do we know about that? Um, 
where your, your vaccine efficacy comes from, right, components of your immune system, and so we can measure those individually. And so those would really come in, in four categories. Certainly the antibodies are important, but also these other components. Um, and I'll, let's see, I'll go to the pointer. Uh, <clears throat> and so we know um, data a good six months or seven months, seven months from the first immunization, six from the second immunization for, for Moderna. Um, and in fact, <laughs> in fact, there's new data on this in Science Magazine that came out an hour ago, but here's the data. Uh, it's basically the same from uh, last month where there, there clearly is durability of, of antibody responses out at seven months. At the same time, they have declined um, and the, 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 the decline is pretty similar uh, across age groups, uh, but it is measurable. And I think the data today are um, maybe a five-fold decline from peak. <clears throat> um, so what about T cell responses? Um, we've actually got um, the most public data on this topic, uh, T cell memory out at six months after vaccination. This is in a uh, a preprint, and actually specifically, we were looking at the low dose Moderna vaccine, but same general topic. Um, and at six months after the second immunization, 97% um, of people still had uh, CD4 T cell memory, and and notably, it was it was pretty stable, not much of a decline in that six month period, which is pretty impressive. Uh, so it, it seems like the RNA vaccines are doing a good job of generating T cell memory. Um, there's been a little more confusion about CD8 T cell memory, um, but uh, at, at this point we know that both the Moderna and the Pfizer vaccines generate CD8 T cells, um, and uh, actually the majority of people end up making a CD8 T cell response as well as a CD4. Uh, fewer people are positive at it six months, and, and I think that's basically because uh, there's actually just not a very big CD8 T cell response. So it's closer to the limit of detection. It hasn't, it doesn't actually change that much between one month and six months. So, so we've got some, uh, so for memory B cells, um, we don't have data out at six months. We have six month data for antibody CD4s and CD8s now, at least for Moderna vaccines. Um, for memory B cells, we don't, uh, but multiple groups have reported memory B cells at two months or so after immunization. And those responses look quite good. And so my prediction from those would actually be that the memory B cells um, to the RNA vaccines will be uh, quite robust and, and long lasting. There's no guarantee there, but, but that's, my, that's my bet. Uh, I don't think that that's um, uh, a crazy one to do. Just simplify this a little. Um, so that's what we know about the immune responses, the immune memory to the vaccines, pretty good stability, uh, I would say over six months. So, so what do we know about efficacy? Um, so here I'm gonna refer to really the clinical trial data. That's what's on this slide, right? The phase three clinical trial data for Pfizer and Moderna. Um, we've gotten more information from both of them in the past, well, weeks, and certainly in the past couple months um, for their six month uh, efficacy trial results, uh, Pfizer reported 91%, Moderna reported 93%, and notably Pfizer's reporting a 95% early and out at the six month uh, and 84% uh, to give an overall efficacy of 91. Uh, Moderna reported 93% overall, and that's where there are question marks here. I haven't seen a preprint yet. Um, presumably that means an early efficacy of something like 95 and then a six month of 90. Again, these are the phase three clinical trial results. Those would be against the D614G and alpha. And, and just for reference, right, these are the data sets that are being submitted to the FDA for vaccine approval. And they're really important reference points because these are the actual placebo controlled clinical trials um, controlling for lots of, of confounders, I think. So, so with those data in mind, uh, what are we looking at uh, going forward in terms of how long the vaccines might last, both in terms of having immune memory lasting and vaccine protection? Well, um, <laughs> in an imaginary world without Delta, right? Uh, that's an easier one to think about first and because you can directly extrapolate. Uh, <clears throat> and, and really it does depend on your definition of protection. Uh, uh, and then it's gonna depend on, on the durability of these antibodies. And, and that's because um, it really comes down to between six and 12 months or six months, 12 months and two years, do the antibodies stabilize or do they keep declining at the same rate? Because the data that I just showed you and, and 
uh, on the T cells is that the, the T cells are actually relatively stable. So whatever they're doing now, it looks like they're still going to be doing, you know, six months from now. Um, and the memory B cells, there's not data, um, but uh, my inference based on the other data is that they'll be quite stable uh, as well. And, and in the context of COVID infections, let's say natural immunity, um, antibody titers decline to around the six month time point, And then they really stabilize pretty well, not, not completely, but maybe have a twofold decline, you know, between six months and 12 months, not a big decline. And that's because it's out in this time window that really the long lasting uh, response is, is occurring. And we just don't have that data yet for the RNA vaccine. So, you know, the optimistic look would be that it would stabilize a lot like um, natural immunity and then a pessimistic view would be that it would decline at the same rates it is already, in which case um, there really wouldn't be much antibody around at, at, at 12 months. Uh, given the overall quality of the rest of the immunity, uh, the rest of the, the memory, I should say, uh, my prediction would be that it would, it would stabilize a substantial amount between six months and, and 12 months. Okay. And then the second part was to get at uh, well, you know, again, in a magical world, in an imaginary world without Delta, would there still be protection um, out of 12 months now that we have data at six months? <clears throat> and really that depends a lot on your definition of, of protection. Are, we, are you talking about protection from infection, asymptomatic only, you know, uh, PCR positive, or, you know, posse symptomatic, really uh, cold-like, flu-like, hospitalized, ICU, or fatal, right? And each of those result in in different definitions of, of predictions about protection. And this is definitely relevant for Delta as well, which is why I'm introducing it. And to me, a lot of this does come down to the anatomy um, of this viral infection and the anatomy of immunity to it. Uh, and I uh, generally talk about this as a viral infection in two phases, uh, really the upper respiratory tract infection phase and, uh, and the lung um, infection phase or the nasopharyngeal and oral cavity phase and then the lung phase. And that's because um, obviously not only are they different locations, but this is a virus that replicates very fast in nasopharyngeal spaces and in the oral cavity. So it's, it's a very, it's a hard, it's a relatively hard virus to stop in those spaces because it replicates fast and transmits fast. Whereas the lung infection is actually relatively slow um, in contrast to say for flu, whereas the, the, if it gets to the lung, it's a very fast infection for SARS-CoV-2, it's relatively slow, right? Which is what, why we uh, generally talk about hospitalizations at, uh, at 14 to 21 days, right? And, and measuring mortality at it at 28 days, as opposed to these uh, upper respiratory tract infections in uh, looking at sort of the, the, the six day time window, all right? And so because of that, <clears throat> if we're talking about protection from infection or uh, protection from asymptomatic infections, uh, really if you're looking out at 12 months, it, it is probably gonna depend a lot on the antibody titers because the T cell responses will take several days to kick in and, and they're um, less likely to be major players in, in preventing the asymptomatic, but preventing, you know, posse symptomatic or cold-like, if it's six days to time of symptom onset, that's a decent amount of time for the T cells and memory B cells to kick in and, and contribute. So even if the antibody titers are relatively low, you can have reasonable protection against those. But most importantly, right, if we're talking out at the hospitalization, ICU fatal cases, again, there's a lot more time to protect against those. Every 24 hours matters a lot for speed of the immune response because your T cells can expand 10 times um, every single day, essentially. So 72 hours, you have easily a thousand fold more T cells available. So a, a seven day window, right, before you actually have significant problems in the lung is, is plenty of time, uh, it looks like, for the T cells and other components to, to respond and prevent these more severe uh, outcomes. Uh, <clears throat> which still probably have antibody as a correlate of protection. So with those things in mind, you know, what are the mechanisms of protective immunity? Really the simplest option for any vaccine development is high level long lasting neutralizing antibodies. And that's still true for COVID-19. Um, and uh, correlates of immunity, uh, correlates of protection keep pointing to antibodies as a key correlate. Um, and there's a new Moderna study out yesterday, day before yesterday. Um, uh, reinforcing that with some really nice calculations. Uh, 
but those are really talking about cases, right? Prevention of, of cases, either PCR positive cases or symptomatic cases. And when we're talking about the more severe outcomes, the hospitalization level disease, uh, there are a variety of lines of evidence that point to contributions of T cells uh, against COVID-19 and particularly at that level of disease. And, and I think it's still quite reasonable to consider that hospitalization level disease is prevented by any decent combination of antibody CD4s and CD8s, all right? So with that in mind, um, what about Delta, right? Because that's, that's definitely the world that we live in. Um, this is what I said a month ago, which is not unlike what a lot of people said. Um, at this point, you're either vaccinated or you're going to catch Delta. And, and that's basically because it's so incredibly uh, infectious or transmissible, depending on your preferred order. Um, and, and that simply based on what we've known about SARS-CoV-2 all along, um, it, is, it does have a, a relatively high level of hospitalization compared to other you know, common infectious diseases. Um, <clears throat> So let, let's start with the good news about immunity to variants and, and Delta, and then go on to the not so good news. Um, really the good news about immunity to variants is that the vaccines um, uh, are doing quite well at generating immune responses that are, that are good at, at targeting uh, variants. And I love this summary in Scientific American that really just kind of points out your, your immune system has really evolved to deal with variants. Um, and uh, Delta has a modest to moderate degree of antibody escape, no obvious escape from T cells, and, and memory B cells have been shown to have an excellent repertoire uh, against, uh, against this virus. Um, and, and, and one of the clearest examples of that has come from people who had natural immunity or had COVID-19 cases, and then got one dose of RNA vaccines, so which, um, which I called hybrid immunity. And those people made huge antibody responses, but notably they made very broad antibody responses, antibodies that could even neutralize uh, original SARS, SARS-1. Um, and so that's a very good sign for being able to recognize both Delta and other variants. And specifically about Delta, it, it does fit into antibody recognition of, of variants. Here's my favorite summary of this from uh, Moderna actually. So here's initial neutralization, and here's Delta over here. So it's just, it's a two-fold decline. Uh, whereas for beta, there's an eight-fold decline. Uh, so that's good news number one that's specific about Delta um, as opposed to general about variants. And I'd say good news number two is uh, really the Public Health England paper in the New England Journal uh, with Pfizer vaccine showing 88% efficacy against symptomatic um, and vaccine prevention of hospitalizations and this other preprint by them was equal to alpha really in the 95% range, okay. Um, and that uh, Carlos will talk about this some more, but that, that's consistent with a lot of the experience in the US of, of really looking like a pandemic of the unvaccinated, right? Most deaths in cases are, are predominantly occurring in, in counties and regions with low vaccination rates. And that's true as well for San Diego where I live, where um, that's been largely the experience. So the bad news about Delta, um, really the big challenge with Delta is that it's so much more transmissible than the original strain, it's incredibly hard to stop. Um, and, and really this is possibly an unprecedented change in terms of the amount of, of the r not shift. Um, so that's the first thing, it being so much more transmissible is a big challenge. Uh, second is that definitely not all of the vaccine efficacy, efficacy studies agree like at all, and, and, and we can come back to that later. And then third is really, you know, uh, uh, a bit of bad news is that why is Delta so dominant that, that we don't know. Um, it really wasn't anticipated based on the viral sequence that Delta would become such a big deal. And so um, I'm right near the end of it here summarizing the virology. Um, how is Delta a different virus? What, what do we know? Um, I, I think there's still a lot of possibilities. Uh, there's still a lot of uncertainty here. Uh, the, the real world experience is uh, uh, of the human experiment, so to speak, of, of so many people being infected is, is way out ahead of the, the virology at this point. Um, the simplest scenario that could explain why Delta is so different is, is really just three spike mutations. Um, uh, that the Delta NTD is seen in all the variants of concern in most VOIs. Uh, the 452 mutation, this is an L to R. Uh, this is certainly a key mutation in Delta. And it was actually originally seen in the California variant, the California variants. Uh, certainly important 
some for escape, but but probably also for transmissibility. Um, and really, Raul and Dino at, at UCSF, who was actually my PhD mentor, um, I think his neutralization of plaque assay data on this virus, on this mutation, still are, are some of the key data there. That it it looks like it makes bigger plaques, and it's it's a more vigorous virus. And then the six eight one mutation. So this is uh, also seen in alpha. Uh, and so this mutation is important for processing of the spike into, uh, into two uh, subunits, but also that really sets the spring loading. So essentially how easy or hard is it to, to pop that spike open and drive the fusogenic event. Uh, and alpha has a mutation at exactly the same location, not the exact same mutation. And so it's possible that, that these are just really key sites for the virus and deltas hit upon the perfect combination of those for, for gaining transmissibility. Um, the more complex scenario would be to say, yes, those are important, but there are also other spike mutations and a whole series of non-spike mutations that really might be driving fitness of, of this virus. And, and really one of the challenges with trying to parse this is that we, we don't know for sure which ways this virus is better. Um, Viral loads faster, uh, almost certainly, still uncertain, but symptoms faster, transmission faster, more infectious, more viral particles, more virulent. Um, uh, all of those with question marks, uh, there's actually still significant uncertainty about. The partial antibody evasion is, is confident. And then all of those could play into these over here as well. And then these other factors that could be driven by non-spike mutations, such as faster replication machinery or innate immune evasion. Um, so there's uncertainty and really the speed of the virus affects how good the immunity is and which parts of the immunity are important. And, and so our uncertainties on the virology side still do drive some uncertainties about immunity since it's a race. And is it a race here, here, here? And is the race the same or different? And how does it tie into um, disease severity? So I will stop there, hopefully setting the table for, for Carlos. Thanks, Bob. Thank you, Shane. That was terrific. A huge amount of data and appreciate the, the certainty and the uncertainty. This is a, a rapidly evolving story. And, uh, you know, you are uh, one of the handful of experts in the universe and the fact that you are confused, <laughs> so maybe reassuring, maybe, maybe, maybe not, but, uh, you know, so I, much. Said, I, I like to give talks when I have a when I have a clear message, you know, and all my data. Yeah. You prefer that I give talks when there's a lot of uncertainty. <laughs> well, that's <laughs> we, we, we could have waited a year or two, but uh, that probably <laughs> would not have been acceptable on other levels. All right. Let me uh, bring on Carlos. And uh, as I said, we'll bring Shane back after Carlos is done. If, uh, if you don't have a lot of questions that you want Shane to answer, then you weren't listening carefully. <laughs> and uh, I, Carlos's talk will bring up even more questions, I'm sure. So Carlos, it's all yours. Thank you, Bob. And uh, thanks again for the invitation to be uh, in your Department of Medicine Grand Rounds. This is just a terrific event and I like watching them all the time. And I really appreciate what you've done for educating uh, everybody about COVID. And in particular, you know, not only your Grand Rounds that you post on, on on YouTube, but also your Twitter feeds and all the different things that are just being incredibly helpful to all of us throughout the pandemic. So where are we in the global pandemic? Well, as you can see here, we are entering what globally is called the third wave, right? Because we went down, up again, and, and down and up again as right now. And we have passed a critical number of 200 million infections globally and over 4 million deaths. And I try to remind people that this pandemic is not over, it's accelerating. You can see here that we passed 200 million cases on August 6th. You can see we passed 4 million deaths in July the 8th. And you can see in this table how those cases went. And you know, in the last uh, 53 days, we, we accumulated another 25 million cases. And in fact, we have had now in 2021 more deaths, and we're not done with this year, that we had in the entire year of 2020. So when people say, well, I'm glad the pandemic is almost over, this was before Delta, I remind them that globally it's not. Now, even globally, the pandemic is very different. I'm putting two countries here. You see India on one side and Brazil on the other. And you can see India had this massive uh, spike in, in, in March, April, uh, you know, April, May, and then came down. And that spike was primarily due to Delta. You can see that 94% of the cases then in India were Delta and Delta created this massive spike similar to what we're seeing. Brazil hasn't seen that. Brazil really has not had multiple waves. It's sort of a 
uh, a mountain that keeps on getting higher and never comes down. And you can see that their epidemic is primarily a gamma epidemic. And you can see how nicely the, sort of they had a little delta and then again is being taken over by gamma again. So every country is a little different and the, the transmission dynamics, a lot of it are gonna depend on what the prevalent uh, variant is in that site. Now, many people are saying, well, you know, India came down so rapidly, the UK is coming down so rapidly, maybe the same thing is gonna happen in the US, we're gonna reach a peak, it's gonna come down. But I remind you that the UK did not come down. There was an inflection point after a rapid descent from the Delta surge in the UK. And a lot of people are asking why. And I think, I think a big part of it could be the fact that if you remember, the UK had this day of independence in which they say, we lift all restrictions, we're done with this. And maybe that's caused that it didn't continue going down as opposed to India and other places where it did. So I caution you that what we are in a, in a rapid accelerated growth right now in the US, we cannot say, well, you know, once we reach a peak, it's gonna come down very rapidly and go back to, to where we were before. So this is where we are now. And you can see, this is what we're concerned about. It is this big surge we're seeing in our country. And it is primarily, uh, we are driving the pandemic globally. If you normalize cases per million population, it is the US that is driving the global pandemic. This is where the epidemic is accelerating the fastest. And this is why many of us are very, very concerned. And where is it growing? Well, you can see the states that it's growing, you know, Louisiana, Florida, Arkansas, you know, it's growing throughout the country, but some states are really driving the pandemic. And in fact, of the entire United States, Florida has one out of every five new diagnoses. And the rate in Florida, if Florida was a country at a rate of 127 per 100,000 population, it would have the highest rate of any country in the world. And in fact, if Florida was a country the United States would have issued travel warnings and travel restrictions that will not allow people from Florida to travel into this country. This is what community transmission looks like. And currently about 70% of counties in the US are in what we call the high transmission area and 18% are in substantial transmission. And high transmission being in red, substantial transmission being in orange. And where you wanna be is in yellow and blue. And you can see that not much of the country is in yellow and blue. But this has changed very dramatically. If I show you the exact same figure from a month ago, you would see a very different picture. And again, it just shows you how rapidly Delta has spread throughout our country. Now it is spreading faster in places where, high, where low vaccination rates. And you can see here the spike in cases, again, that rapid increase in cases that you're seeing in Louisiana. You can see the changes in the, in the, in the, in the R not. But more importantly, what you see here is the percent unvaccinated or the percent vaccinated in this case. And you can see that only 37.2% of the population in Louisiana is fully vaccinated, which is exactly what is driving the pandemic in that state and in many parts of the United States. So talking about vaccines, let's talk about vaccines, about variants, about mandates. So this is a national picture on vaccination and dark blue is where you wanna be. You wanna be a state that has high percentage of your population vaccinated like Vermont, Massachusetts, Maine, Connecticut, Rhode Island, you go down. And where you don't wanna be is in the sort of light blue area of the country. And that's, you know, Tennessee, you're truly here in Georgia, Louisiana, Arkansas, Mississippi, Alabama. And in fact, you know, the good news is 70% of adults in the US have had only one, uh, have had at least one dose. That was a goal, remember, for the Biden administration. The bad news is one dose doesn't do much against Delta and we'll see that later. So you really need to have people to have received at least two doses and be two weeks out. So even we are very proud in our country that people over 65, you know, fully vaccinated, we say, well, 78% of people over 65 are fully vaccinated. Well, in fact, the US has vaccinated fewer people over 65 than in England. So again, when we talk about having done a good job We've done a good job, but not as good a job as we could have done. And I think this is a good example of that. England has done a much better job vaccinating the older individuals than what we have in our country. This is the graph that CDC put out last uh, a couple of weeks ago. And again, scared all of us. And it scared all of us because it showed the, how the, the, the Delta variant uh, uh, R0 had changed. And as Shane said, we've never seen a virus do this, right? It went from an R0 the ancestral stain somewhere around two and a half to an R naught somewhere between five and eight. And this is where, you know, CDC said, well, Delta is as transmissible as chickenpox. I would say I don't agree necessarily with that statement, but that has been made as a, as a very important statement. But 
not only is uh, maybe it's as transmissible as chickenpox, but you can see that the fatality for chickenpox is very low and the fatality for this infection is much higher. And that is a problem because when you tell people this is like chickenpox, they say, well, you know, in my house when we were young, before we had vaccines, my mom, my grandma would have uh, chickenpox parties. We all got vaccinated, we all got it, you know, infected and that was it. Well, that's not the case with COVID and using the example of chickenpox is not helping. So what does a change of the r naught of that magnitude means? Well, what it means is that if you go 10 cycles of transmission of a virus in a fully naive population, you will go, if an r naught was 2.5, you will have about 9,536 persons infected. If your r naught goes to six, now you have after 10 cycles, 60 million point four, point five, 60.5 million people infected. That is the difference. This is significantly important. And people don't realize what the impact of that change in r naught does. The other thing that it does is it also changes your herd immunity dramatically. When the r naught was 2.5, we said, well, 60% between infected and vaccinated gets us to herd immunity. When you got to an r naught of six, your herd immunity threshold is somewhere around 84, 85%. In other words, a place you, you're unlikely going to get just by asking people to be vaccinated. Now, this is the cases in the US at, at, at percent of the population vaccinated. And you can see a very nice relationship between those states with low vaccination rates, percent of the population vaccinated here, and those, the high accounts, the seven day case count per, per 100,000 population. And this shows you very nicely that that correlation exists. But even in states with very high vaccination rate, and remember I said an R naught needs to be somewhere in the order of 80% or so, you're not gonna get there yet, even in states that we're doing very, very well. So mandates are appearing and many healthcare institutions are issuing mandates. I only put this there because there's a pretty good website run out of uh, uh, a Brown in which they're trying to track healthcare institutions that are issuing mandates. And I would encourage if your institution is, to use the form available there and complete it. But more importantly, uh, companies are requiring mandates. And you can see here, this is from August 7th. There's a list of companies that at that point in time had issued mandates. There's even more companies right now. But I think the, the going phrase that we're hearing over and over is no jab, no job. And I think mandates are gonna make a big difference in, and it's gonna be corporate America that's gonna do that. Unfortunately, unfortunately, there are many people in America that are employed outside of corporate America. The corporate America employs about 145 million individuals. So we're gonna get mandates from other places that are outside corporate America, such as you know, educational institutions. And we're seeing that from colleges, universities, and other places, but we may see them go down to high schools or junior high or even elementary schools. So will, variants, uh, will vaccines work against the variants? The short answer is yes. Here's this graph recently put out by a colleague of mine, uh, BK Tajani, and again, you can look at it. What she's trying to show you is the different you know, variants, the wild type, alpha, beta, gamma, delta, and the efficacy of different vaccines and whether you get one shot or two shot and what happens. And you can see that some of the problems is we have a lot of data missing and we have a lot of variability. So Eric Topol put it recently this out. And I think a couple of things here is that you first see this all over the place. You know, Public Health England, uh, the article that was mentioned previously, Pfizer, 88% effectiveness uh, against uh, Delta variant, AstraZeneca, 60%. I think what some of us are getting concerned about is the data coming out below that from Israel, from the REACT study, from the Mayo Clinic recently as a preprint, from Qatar, showing much, much lower vaccine efficacy. So I'm going to focus on the Israel study with 39% vaccine efficacy. And I want to reassure you that the decline on vaccine protection against Delta infection reported in that study did not impact hospitalizations and deaths. And you can see here, while you had symptomatic COVID with, with a vaccine efficacy of 40%, the vaccine efficacy against hospitalization was 88%, and the vaccine efficacy against severe COVID was 91%. So emphasize this because people say, well, it doesn't work. Well, it still works against some of the most important outcomes that we have, which is hospitalizations and deaths. So how about breakthroughs? Well, you know, the big sort of sort of the turning point in breakthrough, as Paul Sachs called it, sort of the, the, the case study is, uh, is, is the, uh, the uh, a Provincetown uh, outbreak that occurred during the 4th of July a weekend in which what we've heard is several things is that many of the cases were fully vaccinated. Uh, the, those fully vaccinated had cycle thresholds very similar 
that those patients who were not vaccinated, sacral threshold is about 22. And, and people you know, said, this is very concerning. And in fact, this is what led CDC to change their masking recommendations. But a couple of things that haven't been said, people inter interpreted this, this outbreak by saying vaccines don't work. This was a stress test for vaccines. And to me, what this shows is exactly the opposite. The vaccines work because they work because out of those thousand people or more that have now been traced back to this outbreak, five had been hospitalized and none has died. So the vaccines were highly effective in protecting against hospitalization and death. This is a summary again from Eric Topol who does his great tables of the different Delta breakthrough studies. I'm not gonna go through them, but suffice to say that outbreaks, that breakthroughs are gonna happen and we need to get used to them. And the, the, you know, the risk is calculated that your, your risk of getting COVID disease, if you're fully vaccinated, it's eight times lower than if you're not. Your risk of getting hospitalized is 25 fold lower and your risk of dying is 25 fold lower. So trying to educate people in our state, the Department of Health here in, in, in Georgia recently did this graph, which I don't totally like because the 24 should have been a little dot down here, but they try to say that a 4 million people fully vaccinated, a lot of, little bit under 5,000 have tested positive, 118 are hospitalized and only 24 have died. So your chance of dying if you were fully vaccinated are somewhere in the 0.00058%. Again, emphasizing that the vaccines are working because when you hear about breakthroughs and you hear about low effectiveness, people are saying, well, why should I get vaccinated if it doesn't work anyway? We need to say they do work. The other positive study that is still in preprint has not been formally published is this coming out of Singapore, showing that yes, while people have similar cycle thresholds between vaccinated and unvaccinated, what you see in the vaccinated is a much rapid clearance of, of the virus. So the immune system is doing something and rapidly clearing the virus much rapidly than in those that are unvaccinated. So we really don't know, yes, you have similar cycle thresholds, but for how long, what are the kinetics and what's that gonna determine? So I have to end by, by quoting my good friend, George Rutherford, which says, you know, if you're vaccinated, this is nothing. If you're not vaccinated, you're hosed. And I couldn't agree with him more. How about our children? Well, you know, the single most important thing parents can do is to get vaccinated and to vaccinate all their kids who are 12 and older. And masks are the second most important thing we can do. Universal masking of children over the age of two indoors, including in schools, adds an additional protection. And to me, it's been very distressing how much politicized we have made the masks to the point that in many states, you know, local state boards have been prohibited by to, to have mask mandates. And I think that's a travesty that simply just, we, you know, I don't know why is it happening? I cannot even believe it. So will we need booster shots? And my answer is no, not at this point and not everybody. And I just point to their editorial I recently wrote in, in the New, in New York Times about this. There are gonna be needs for boosters for some people, but you don't need to go out there and run and get a booster. As I remind people, I'm 62. I, I'm fully vaccinated. I got vaccinated in December, early January. I'm not out there running looking for a vaccine because the people I'm seeing in the hospital are unvaccinated individuals. So in summary, I think vaccinated persons are much safer than unvaccinated persons, but they're not completely safe. Breakthrough infections are, occur often enough with Delta that you will see them. And the frequency with, with which a vaccinated person transmits, it's not clear. So we're hearing, well, if vaccinated persons can get infected and can transmit, true, but we don't know how much they transmit. And I think that's an important component. I think masking indoors is important and needs to continue to be important. And I remind my friends that most of us ID docs never stop wearing masks indoors after the third surge, even after CDC said, oh, you no longer need to mask. And this is indeed a pandemic of the unvaccinated and it's really time to, to have vaccine mandates because by asking people to get vaccinated, we are not gonna get to a level of vaccination we need to really get to herd immunity. In fact, I don't think we're ever gonna to get to herd immunity in, in, against this pandemic. And with that, Bob, I'll just acknowledge some people that have provided slides and information. And uh, thank you for your, your uh, listening and happy to answer any questions and have the discussion we talked about. Great, thank you so much, Carlos. That was terrific, an enormous amount of information in a short period of time and uh, lots of fodder for, for discussion. So let, <laughs> let's start. Um, 
Oh, even where where to start? This issue of can a breakthrough can inf infection in a vaccinated person uh, transmit? You have these sort of competing pieces of data, one that the viral load seem to be similar, the other that maybe you're, you're, you clear the virus more quickly. Is it fair to say that that we're fairly confident that's, that a, a vaccinated person who gets an infection can transmit maybe at a slightly lower level than an unvaccinated person? Is that how you'd interpret that? The way I would interpret it, Bob, is I would say a vaccinated person can transmit, yes, but it's for a shorter period of time. So their time, the number of days that are infectious are significantly lower. And therefore, if that, you know, especially that, that information from Singapore is repeated, and I've heard from a couple of people that are doing similar studies that are getting similar results. So I would say, yes, you can transmit, but you transmit for a shorter period of time. And therefore, the, the, your contribution to transmission is much lower if you're vaccinated than if you're not. Okay. <clears throat> Shane, I don't know if you're on, I don't see you on my screen. Um, so in terms of, there we go. In terms of uh, how a vaccinated person should feel, there just seems like a lot of ambiguity in the data about how likely it is that you will get an infection. And Carlos, you made the point that, that even if you get an infection, very likely to be mild, not to lead to a hospitalization and not to lead to death. But I guess there are two things that have always weighed on me as a vaccinated person. One is, uh, can I transmit it to others? The second is, can I get a mild case that might lead to long COVID? And, you know, I, I'm going to approach this differently if I know I'm going to have a mild, like like a cold for three days, than if I might still have brain fog more than my, I usually do. I'm sure half the department is saying to themselves, uh, you know, six weeks out or, or, or I'm going to have headaches or I'm not going to be able to smell or taste two months out. So we already talked about transmissibility. It sounds like, yes, you probably can, maybe for a shorter period of time. How about long COVID? Do we know anything about that? And maybe both of you might want to weigh in. Shane, do you want to start? Carlos, you want to go first? Well, I would just say I was going to pass it over to you because I, I think my, my, my feeling, my gut feeling is that you're less likely to get long COVID once you've been immunized, if you get reinfected, because what the data that is beginning to emerge is that a strong immune response is actually sort of protective for long COVID. So having some degree of immune, I look at, 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 at reinfection with COVID, especially mild cases, as infection limiting to the nose and the upper respiratory system and not going systemically, not going to the lungs. So my, my gut feeling is you're less likely to get long COVID. Less, less but not you're impervious to it. Uh, yes, again, because you're not impervious because some people who get reinfected develop severe disease. Yeah. But if you have okay. a mild case, I don't think, I don't think if you got a URI kind of nasal congestion with, with reinfection, you're going to get long COVID, but maybe Shane, you think differently. Go ahead, Shane. Oh, it's, I mean, it's, I think it's a really hard question and one that again, there, there isn't much um, solid data on. I, I fully agree with, uh, with Carlos's intuition that, uh, that in general, a, a truly uh, mild, not simply mild being defined as, you know, didn't have to go to the hospital, but, you know, really posi-symptomatic little uh, uh, cold-like symptoms and for a short period of time is, is unlikely to result in longer term sequelae than, than other infections of a similar magnitude. Uh, I, I think the big unknowns are, is the, What basically what is resulting in, in long COVID, right? Is, is, it, is it essentially uh, a really extensive infection for a long while that caused uh, damage in various places that's still been difficult to define and then thus is, is a result of magnitude and duration of viral load um, or certain types of immune responses to that, which for example would be autoimmune, which have largely been seen in people with severe disease. So again, you know, less likely substantially less likely in, in virus. Uh, I mean, I think people have highlighted that there, there is the healthcare worker study that said that some people with breakthrough infections still had um, some symptoms six weeks later. And my understanding was that a big caveat of that is that the, there's not a control group there. So it's it's sort of, you're always gonna see people reporting right. 
symptoms to a survey. And so that, that's certainly not my wheelhouse for how to control for that kind of variable. Right. I mean, that was a study out of Israel from two weeks ago that uh, a relatively small number of people had breakthrough infections. 19% still had symptoms six weeks out, no control group. So hard to know if you just ask random people, do you have headaches or have brain fog? Some would probably say yes. So it, it is tricky to adjust for that. I'll be most interested in seeing the anosmia numbers for breakthrough infections. I think that's going to be one that's pretty quantifiable. And the duration yep. of that, you know, could be that that's a pretty clear cut one. Um, so far, the ones that I've heard have been transient. Uh, Got it. Uh, Carlos, you, you, you said uh, herd immunity, when you do the, the fancy math, you say we might need 80% of a population uh, vaccinated. Uh, and then you said, we'll never get there. And is that because the vaccine efficacy to get to that 80% has to be 100% efficacious? So if the vaccines are not 100% effic efficacious, the number has to be higher. I'm, we're struck by that in San Francisco because we're the most vaccinated major city in the country. We're 70% of all people, including kids, are fully vaccinated. And we're seeing a pretty decent sized spike despite you know, numbers that are not that far off from 80%. You know, I think, I think it's because the, um, I, I, I think it's because of efficacy. And I think you have a combination of, I think you, you know, the, the, the numbers of herd immunity are, are predicated on the basis of a full protection. You know, they come from measles and other diseases where the vaccines are highly protective against infection. I think when you start seeing the drop in efficacy, uh, David Paltiel had a paper this morning, actually, or yesterday and made a, a preprint that I didn't mention, but I'll mention now. And he did some modeling and said, you know, talking about college campuses and opening and talking about the fact that if you had a vaccine with, you know, you had 90% uh, coverage with a vaccine about 50% efficacy, which pretty much where we could be, uh, you will still have enough cases in campus that you can open and you, you will be, you know, you can open safely, but it's going to be an ongoing transmission happening. You may not, you're not going to have, you know, outbreaks, but you're going to have ongoing cases. And I think that's what that may be. I think we need to start shifting our thinking from eradication and disease elimination and COVID anytime soon to more disease management, the way we think about flu. So let's talk about boosters for a second. If you have in some ways both said that, that the good news about the vaccines is they still prevent you from getting very sick and dying. The bad news is some combination of maybe waning immunity over time, although as Shane said, not a ton, but a little, uh, plus Delta being a nastier bug is leading to efficacy numbers that are very different than the ones we thought we were dealing with. You know, nobody's talking about 95% total efficacy anymore. We're debating whether it's 50 or 70 or 80. Um, if that number could be boosted back up to 80 or 90% efficacious with a booster, um, and I don't know whether it can, but what, what's the argument against boosters? Is it just limited resource we want to concentrate on vaccinating unvaccinated people? limited resource, we want to send vaccines to other countries that have no one vaccinated? Or is it just on, on an individual basis, would you say there isn't a strong enough case for me who got my Pfizer vaccine seven or eight months ago, if I could walk down to the Walgreens today and get an extra shot that I should or shouldn't do that? Anyway, Shane, why don't you start with that and then we'll turn to Carlos. I know that's a lot. Yeah, okay, there are a number <laughs> of questions in there. Uh, so where I normally start is that top line, the boosters are going to work, first of all, right? So, so there's clear uh, immunogenicity clin clinical trial data from both Moderna from months ago and more recently from Pfizer that, that uh, certainly the RNA vaccine boosts um, will work. And also RNA vaccine boosts on top of an AstraZeneca are, are, are boosting really well. Mm -hmm. uh, and that those boosts take people up to the same antibody titers they had before or maybe twice as high, but also better breadth against variants. Um, and so there are, there are positives about that. And, you know, your, your immune system, uh, your immune system is always dealing with immune memory duration of protection, right? And as a, as a cost benefit analysis, right? Is it really worth making that much antibody for several years? And so, every time you get reinfected uh, or re-exposed by a booster, you know, your, your immune system is reevaluating, right? So if something shows up three times, right, i.e. the, 
the third booster immunization, your immune system is likely to make a more durable response to that because the, the information is, right, the initial responses weren't, weren't enough. And give, given the quality of the immune memory, I, I think those things will happen. So I think, first of all, in the short term, booster immunizations certainly make better immune responses and take them up to higher levels than they were. And, and they probably also will, will drive uh, better long-term uh, immune responses. Then you get into, do you need them? Um, then it becomes, yeah, what, what's your individual goal and what, what's the public health goal? Um, uh, but but from, where, from where you said, the, the little doubt that they would work to make you more immune, is there any doubt that they would work to decrease your the risk of transmitting? In terms yeah, of I, think, I, I think they would. Um, I mean, to me, even for Delta, the data, even for example, out of uh, uh, several of the studies that Carlos highlighted, right, that were uh, uh, showing less efficacy, um, the efficacy at early time points, uh, even against just having a positive case, right, was still pretty was still pretty high. So I think if you got the boost, then the efficacy would be back in the ninety percent plus range, and, and probably would stay higher for for longer and yes would would reduce uh would reduce transmissions uh, so it sounds like the you know the real the only the ar maybe the argument against really is this public health trade-off argument not so much at an individual level carlos what what do you say i'm kind of grappling with this because you know we hear about there is enough vaccine around obviously no, you I, theoretically I send it all to india today but you know i think i think we have plenty of vaccine in our country and i think there is there's, there's problems in getting vaccines globally and sending vaccines is, is not gonna be sufficient. I think in a letter that many of us wrote to administration, what we need is, is to really ramp up production in other places globally. Because just sending vaccine is a little bit like, you know, trying to, to you know, take care of the, of the damage in the Titanic by having a bucket and getting water off the ship. It's just not gonna do it, right? So you need to really ramp up and you need to therefore release some of the patents and and restrictions that allow those vaccines to be produced globally at multiple facilities. But that's another story. I mean, I think the approach to the global vaccine shortage is, is an issue of equity, but it's also an issue of logistics, distribution, manufacturing, many other things that go beyond, you know, it, it, I don't want to fall into this thing that many of us had, you know, when our parents, we were little, somebody will say, you know, you've got to finish your food because kids in India are not eating. Well, you know, that's not going to make the difference to the kid in India not eating the fact that I finished my food or not. So mm -hmm. I think we need to also realize that, that that solution of saying, well, we should await and, and not do that. However, I do think there is a an important, uh, what the WHO director is asking for by saying, let's, let's put a pause on boosters, is he's trying to put attention globally and from the companies in trying to get at least 10% of the population globally vaccinated. I, I get very concerned that colleagues overseas who are physicians, who are healthcare providers are still not vaccinated. People over 60 are not vaccinated in many countries, they're dying. We need to get those high risk individuals vaccinated in those countries before we start doing, you know, giving boosters to, to 16 year olds in this country, right? Now, do we need to give additional doses to people in this country that are severely immunocompromised, older individuals? I think so, and if we have the vaccines, we ought to do it because that's the right thing to do. But I just don't want, you know, to have a 30 year old, you know, relative of mine saying, oh, you know, I need to get a booster because this is what everybody else is gonna do. And I think that's what's gonna happen. I also will say that I think Bob, and this is something that I've been thinking lately, that quite frankly, one of the reasons the FDA may be delaying the approval of the vaccines is in fact that, because as you know, once the FDA gets full approval of the vaccines, they can advertise the vaccines in television, but they can also make them available for sale. And mm -hmm. that at that point, you will, you know, right now if you get a booster, you're essentially violating the, the, the EUA. The EUA is not written to give boosters. And that's what the FDA wants to do to change the EUA. But once they give full approval, anybody can walk and get an additional dose of vaccines. For that matter, me, I as a physician can say, well, my 10 year old, or I can give them vaccine. I'll do it outside the, the range that is allowed. So you will start seeing things done with the vaccines once they're approved that you're not seeing right now. And I, I, I'm thinking that that may be part of the FDA thinking of why wait on the, on the approval. Uh -huh. But just in terms of the, you know, you're my age. I, I assume you got vaccinated uh, with an mRNA more Almost than seven time. or eight months year, uh, ago. 
Uh, let's put the global thing aside for a second. I understand we shouldn't exactly, but but it, in some ways a different question. If you got the call from CVS today that we got extra Pfizer and Modernas, you can get a third shot. Would you take it? I'm not. I'm not ready to take a third shot. I don't think I need it. I I think if I was, uh, you know, not 62 but 72 or 82, I may it may be a different situation. Or if I was receiving a biological, if I was a transplant patient. It may be a different situation, but given the fact that I'm otherwise a healthy adult and I'm 62, I, I'm, I'm not running out there to get a shot right now. Okay, uh, great. Uh, let, let's talk, talk for a second about what you both <laughs> do. We've got a few questions about that. So how, as Delta has become a thing over the last couple of months, has your behavior changed in terms of restaurants, travel, going to a sports stadium or going to some other place with a big crowd? Uh, do you wear a different mask than you did if you do wear masks going indoors? Um, Shane, do you want to start? How has your behavior changed in the last couple of months? Sure. Um, I definitely went to not wearing a mask, like essentially the, the between time, I guess, so to speak. Um, to, that magical month that was kind of okay, right? May and June, um, right? In, in most situations, unless I was... Um, Indoors in a place where I thought there were lots of unvaccinated people, um, but now certainly at work. Uh, as of several weeks ago, we, we started having. Uh, I loved having our in-person lab meetings, and, and I'd say two weeks ago we went back to having masks at uh, in-person lab meetings, and around then I went back to yeah, an N95 um, in indoor spaces, um, the KN95s, the, the easy ones, and starting next week we're going back to remote. Lab meetings, Zoom lab meetings for a while. Uh, yeah, uh, for a couple of reasons related to that. In terms of personal, um, uh, well, I was I was doing a little. My daughter's about to go to college, so we did a little holiday past couple of days, and so we we went uh, we ate at, at restaurants outdoors, and we, we mostly stayed in outdoor spaces. We had to take a ferry, and on that, I sat indoors with a N95 on. Um, I haven't gone to any large events, and don't plan on it. And mm -hmm. I guess uh, I've had older relatives who were going to go to an indoor uh, wedding, you know, of decent size in, in coming weeks. And I said, you know, if, if it's important to you, go. But but otherwise, that's that's not a good, that, that's not a great spot to you. Uh, uh, yeah, I think given some of the uncertainties still around. around Delta. And in terms of boosters, I'm not to answer the booster question, which I think ties into the same thing. If I was offered one today, no, uh, I wouldn't take it. But uh, for uh, relatives of mine who are over the age of 65, yeah, I'm keeping, still keeping an, an eye on it. I definitely think it's appropriate for, for certain at-risk groups to be offered uh, mm -hmm. boosters at this point, I think, uh, for sure. Um, and then how big that group should be, I think, is the question. Okay. Carlos, what, how's your behavior different? Well, I would start by saying that there's a couple of questions in the chat around if asking me, well, would you do the same thing if you had J &J, had received J&J? &J? And since you and San Francisco have already gone into giving boosters to people with J&J, &J, I would say, yeah, I'm a little more anxious about J&J. &J. And if I had just been received J&J, &J, I would be looking for another another vaccination on top of that. Uh, having said that, just when to, just I look to make clear, it would be it would be an mRNA, it would not be another J&J, &J, right? Yeah, and it would be an mRNA vaccine. Having, yeah. having said that, when I look at the, and, and I think we're going to learn a lot from this mix and match studies. And having said that, uh, it's not like the hospitals are full of people that got J&J. &J. When we look at the people admitted, it's equal. It's really no, no different than what actually the distribution of vaccinated people in the country is. Hmm. So again, we're not seeing more failures with J&J, &J, more clinical failures with J&J. &J. Uh, but there is clearly a lower, you know, so the drop, a higher drop in, in, in neutralizing antibodies that you see in J&J, &J, at least documented by some people. It's again, conflicting information. Uh, the uh, personally, so, so I started going to restaurants and then the, during that magical time, I went to a couple of restaurants and then, uh, and then I stopped going to restaurants again. Uh, I'm going, I will go to restaurants. I went, I went to one last Friday. It was, uh, it was indoors, not outdoors. But I, I went at 5.30 in the afternoon and my wife said, why are we going so early? And I said, because there will be nobody there. And indeed, we were the, <laughs> we, we were the only people there and it was totally safe, right? So um, That's because you're in Georgia, not Florida. And Florida, 5.30 is late for dinner. Right, right, right. But in Georgia, it was, you know, I, knew, I knew there would be nobody at the restaurant, so it was, it was fine. But if I had gone there at 
eight or nine o'clock at night, I, I would have not gone indoors. I would have felt totally uncomfortable. Uh, you know, my, uh, my, my, my work, we were, all, you know, we all been wearing masks all the time in my research team and, and that hasn't changed. Uh, but I do, I would have liked to have more in-person meetings with, with my administrative staff and my office staff and we're, we're back to doing uh, uh, virtuals. I'm, I'm still traveling. I've, I've done a lot of, you know, traveling even throughout the pandemic, not a lot, but some traveling even throughout the pandemic. Uh, you know, I, I did a podcast for Shay last week about what do I do when I travel? And again, I think we haven't talked about the value of testing, but I think mass, you know, eye protection and testing go a long way in, in, in protecting you when you're traveling. And again, the problem with traveling is not getting on the plane is what you do after your travel, right? Because when you get somewhere, you go to restaurants and you're going to do things that are put you at higher risk. So how does that test that? It sounds right, but trying to integrate that into a plan, I get asked all the time, I'm, I'm going to go, I need to visit my elderly parents. I'm going to fly. I'm going to wear an N95 and be super careful in the airport. I'm going to get there. Should I be tested? Yes, no, when, given the so, dynamics, it's tricky. So what I do is a 72 hours before I get on the plane, PCR test, if I can, and then I take one of these rapid tests and I take them with me. And when I arrive to my destination, I do a rapid test and then I repeat a rapid test uh, five days later. Okay. And now that rapid tests are readily available, I think it's a, it's a, it's a good approach to try to detect if, you know, if whatever reason you got infected. And I was doing that a lot more even when I was traveling and there were no vaccines. I wasn't vaccinated. Mm -hmm. I would tell you that was a big drop for me. The first trip after I was vaccinated is the first time that I got on a plane without an N95. Got it. All right. We talked a tiny bit about the kids in schools. The questions come up all the time. So, so one question from a, one of our viewers was, I think Shane said, and we've heard this more and more, you're either going to get immune from a vaccine or from COVID. Is that true for kids and the kids who are under 12 who can't be vaccinated now, at least for the next several months? Yeah. I mean, I mean, it's just, it's, it's so transmissible. It's, uh, I mean, certainly if they mask everywhere and stay at home, you know. Uh, but if a, if, 12, if a 10 year old is going to school and wearing a mask carefully and the school is being careful, let's say every, all the teachers and staff are vaccinated, what, what would you say to the parent today that your kid is still fairly likely to get, uh, to get COVID or, or maybe with those steps, you can forestall this for several months until a vaccine comes? That's a good question. I don't know. That's probably the right answer, right? <laughs> yeah, Carlos, what would you say? You know, I, I, I think we, we, we should try to do as much as we can to protect our kids. I, I'm worried that a lot of kids are going to get infected. I also worry, uh, I'm already seeing it among our employees and people are, I don't know what you guys are doing. I'll be very curious in knowing Bob, but young faculty uh, have kids going to school. Kid is now having the sniffles. And uh, does that mean that everybody has to stay home until they get tested and what's gonna do to absenteeism? And, you know, I need somebody who needs to work in the wards and do we need to substitute for that person until that person comes? So those are all new things that we're trying to look at what to do and come up with ideas to make testing readily available for that kid and make things easy for that parent. Otherwise, if you go by standard public health practices, you would put everybody in quarantine until you had the test and people knew. And, the absenteeism is going to go crazy. So I do think that part of the protection is having testing available at home, right? And being able to do that testing. So, so again, that parent with a kid with the sniffles can know my, my kid has COVID, has to stay home, and we can't put him on, on, on isolation at home, or my kid is fine, can go back to school. Because we have, you know, we, we talk a lot about this, this culture of presentism we've had in our society that we go to work sick. But we also have this culture of sending kids to school when they're sick. I mean, all of us, I'm sure at some point in time in, in our lives, we gave a kid a couple of Tylenols and said, you're fine, you're going to go to school. And, and we need to make it easy for people who have a kid who's potentially sick, not sending that kid to school so we can prevent transmission in the schools. Because I think when you look at, there's a lot of the data coming out, a lot of the transmission, having said that, is not happening in the schools, it's happening in the house. The mm -hmm. biggest risk a kid has is the parents are not vaccinated. Mm -hmm. And the tests are reliable now, reliable enough that you use them as a dichotomous. If you're negative, you're good to go. 
if it's positive, it's real? Well, I think, you know, again, that depends. Uh, the tests are pretty good if you're symptomatic, are not as good if you're asymptomatic. And some of the concerns that people have are not the false negatives, but the false positives. If you test positive in a rapid test, you should go ahead and get a PCR to be absolutely sure that it's true, a true positive. But I think they're, they're good enough. Uh, you know, Rochelle Walensky and Dave Paltiel wrote a paper in JAMA Open Network a couple, you know, last year sometime talking about, again, returning to colleges and saying, if you had a less test with low sensitivity, but you do it frequently enough, you will be able to detect individuals. You can use them for surveillance. And they may not be great for diagnosis, but they're really good for surveillance. And they're really good for sort of a, you know, screening of individuals. Okay. Shane, you talked about the, what we know about immunity and whether it wanes after vaccines. Have we learned anything recently about what happens to immunity over time for, after natural infection? Because obviously, if people are going to get immune one way or the other, a lot of people are going to get immune through natural infection. And the end game here depends on how long that lasts. Yeah, there are aspects of it. So, I mean, certainly the numbers that I see that seem reasonable are probably 20% of the U.S. has, uh, has been previously infected. So, you know, in theory, you can, you can add that number on top of the vaccination number for, for assessing herd immunity. Um, and so how long does that last? If we lived in a magical world without, without Delta, um, uh, it, it still looks to me like that immunity lasts uh, uh, against, against Alpha and other things for, for quite, quite a while. There, there hasn't been any big, uh, big shift in that. Uh, but for Delta, um, there's, uh, there's very little information at the moment. And so, um, I very much agree with the recommendations by, I think by most of the scientists and doctors who have studied uh, natural immunity that, that the recommendation is go get a dose of RNA vaccine. And, and again, then you'll, you'll have uh, really fantastic and broad antibodies better than, better than a regular vaccinated person, right. Against, uh, uh, against variants. And that, that also deals with, I think the major, uh, uncertainties about natural immunity where uh, certainly plenty of the people I, that, that talk to me about them having natural immunity I'm like okay so did you have a PCR positive test and they're like well no but I you know but I got sick and I'm pretty sure it's COVID I'm like that does not count uh, there's you know, way too much of that and so people behaving as if they're naturally immune when in fact they caught something else is definitely a big a big problem uh, so if you really did have a PCR positive test and a were antibody positive, that's one thing, but a lot of those aren't. And so uh, uh, I still think a, a blanket policy of uh, people getting a vaccine post, post infection uh, uh, makes sense all around. And are you, are you the, uh, the FDA has not said you can get away with a single shot. They're still saying even after documented infection, you need two. Is your sense that you really only need one and that th that would be the right call? Yeah, that is that is my sense. Um, my understanding is that there are complex reasons the the FDA or the CDC wouldn't wouldn't change a requirement like that, including what I just referred to is how how do you define somebody with with a previous infection, and even mm -hmm. if it, even if you were PCR positive, mm -hmm. who did the test and where where you zero positive, or by what test? I mean, it gets uh, complicated, and so that's. Uh, there are uh, uh, reasons not to get two doses would be just sort of the added complexity, right, of going back twice and concerns about reactogenicity and, and really the reactogenicity data in the actual clinical trials, in the Pfizer and Moderna clinical trials, but particularly in the Pfizer. Um, essentially, there was more reactogenicity after the first dose, but less after the second dose, so that overall people who had evidence of previously been infected uh, essentially had the same reactogenicity as people who didn't, but it just, it was, it was much more tilted to the first dose than the second dose. And so, you know, uh, places that are requiring or recommending two doses, it, it's, it, it's, I think still okay because it, it's really not, uh, you're not adding risk. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. Reactogenicity. I think so far that's been the thought with the boosters too, right? Cause there it's like, well, you know, you're certainly going to have reactogenicity to the booster. How much is that? Those studies have been pretty small, right? They're mm -hmm. just immunogenicity trials of like 50 people. Um, 
so going back to your question of uh, why not do it, right? It's like, well, that, that's still fairly limited, right? Reactogenicity mm -hmm. uh, data. And I was trying to answer the question you asked, right? <laughs> Whereas I fully agree with Carlos's answer, which is more the flip side of, do you need it, right? Um, there's sort of yeah. the will it help versus do you need it? And those are different. I'll stop. Got that. it. Got it. Thanks, Carlos. So, so I think I think one thing that it, this issue of, of vaccination after you had PCR proven COVID is interesting, right? Because the Europeans are accepting COVID plus one dose as being fully vaccinated. And in fact, I was called by somebody I know from Spain saying, look, I had COVID, I got one dose, I'm fully vaccinated. I would like to get a second dose, but the Span the, in, in Europe, they won't give it to me because they are considering me fully vaccinated. And that's gonna create some interesting challenges because for example, we hear the administration is, is soon gonna require that international travelers be vaccinated. Well. For the Europeans, that person is fully vaccinated. For the Americans, that person is not. Yeah. And, and so even deciding who's fully vaccinated is different. And I think that's going to create some interesting policy challenges. Yeah, I could, I could definitely. Definitely, practically speaking, those people are certainly immune. And Absolutely. They're probably, yes. they're probably about the best immune people you could possibly have standing next to you. you know? <laughs> yeah. Right. And people have asked me this. It, 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 it doesn't matter which direction this happens. So if you got vaccinated, then you had a breakthrough infection. Is that as good as if you had an infection and then you get vaccinated? Uh, there's no data on that, to my knowledge. Um, so it's definitely quite impressive if you've if you've had an infection and then you get vaccinated. Certainly, at least with the RNA vaccine, single dose, those are phenomenal responses, high quality, high quantity, probably very durable. The reverse, what happens with a breakthrough infection? The speculation, actually, from my side, would be it, it wouldn't be the same magnitude uh, jump, mm -hmm. but the speculation would be that the downside to the vaccines right, is that they're creating circulating immunity, not local immunity, right? And the deal with natural infection is, well, your body knows this is where you were infected. And so it, it keeps some memory there. And that probably helps explain, right? Why is it that people with natural immunity actually don't get very many infections, even though their antibody titers are substantially less, right? right. That's what the vaccines get. And that's probably this local immunity plus the T cells. Well, so now if you get a breakthrough infection, maybe it does actually pull that get those vaccine T cells and memory B cells and antibodies to be like, oh, this is this is where the immunity is more valuable. And so it would leave that. So not necessarily a bigger ma magnitude, but a location, location, location solution. Yeah. Second yeah. Exposure. So we only have a few minutes left. I want to have you both end with what you, there's a wonderful article that Ed Young wrote in The Atlantic today about sort of the end game here and how that's going to look and feel. What is your sense of life six to 12 months from now and how likely it is that we're going to be talking about a different variant that's even worse and nastier than what we're currently dealing with? Shane, do you want to start with that? Then we'll, we'll finish with Carlos. I'll stick with the variant part of it. Um, so there's several aspects. So one is, is there a variant that's going to escape vaccine immunity? Because I, I get that question all the time. And, yep. and my answer is is no, which I think Carlos gave as well. And, and my answer for that is that all the mutations, it, it keeps being the same mutations that show up in terms of antibody escape. And we and others haven't really seen any signatures of, of T cell escape. And so, it, so far, it really doesn't look like this virus has many ways of evading immunity, uh, adaptive immunity. And again, the vaccine elicited immunity sort of keeps getting broader and broader with, with each exposure. So those things look good. But alpha and then delta showed that this virus can really get a lot more transmissible. Uh, and, and again, those questions that I listed of, of the uncertainties about why is this virus right spreading so much better? Those are still big unanswered questions for looking at how worrisome will variants be in, in the future? So, so basically, if uh, the more, the higher the viral loads, certainly the harder it is for your immune system to control it. The more infectious the virus is, the more the harder it is for your immune system to control it. So it's not that the virus is specifically escaping some specific thing, right? It's just overall a tougher virus. And so I do think we have to get some of those answers on, on Delta before uh, anybody who says, well, Alpha help happened in Delta. Why not something mm -hmm. equally more problematic six months from now? At the moment, I can't argue against that. But like I said in the slides, 
if the simple answer, if the simple scenario uh, is really that it's the 452 and the 681, which are actually mutations that we saw before and just that combination, then, then maybe the virus doesn't have too many tricks left, but it's hard to bet against that at this point. Right, right. And that, that's been a good point for 18 months. It's been hard to bet against the virus being pretty smart. Carlos, I'll give you the last word. What do you think the end game looks like here? If, or if well, it's you know, I, I would start by saying that pandemics end. You know, we've had, the history of humanity has had pandemics multiple times. And whether you read about the 19, you know, 18 flu, or you read about the plague or whatever, they may last X number of years, but pandemics end. So I think that, but the end when the pandemic ends, it's not up to us and politicians. You don't decide the virus or the pathogen decides and the immune system and that complex host pathogen interaction. So the one thing is, is not to, it's not going to end the day we want. And I can think about, I was talking to somebody this morning. It reminds me about, you know, George W. Bush standing in front in an in a, in aircraft carrier saying, you know, mission accomplished. You can't do that. And I think Biden made the mistake of coming out on July 1st and, and July 4th and saying, oh, this is day of independence from the virus. Well, you know, that's not his call. And, and I think that was a mistake. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I think that that controlling this pandemic is going to be very challenging, uh, especially with a virus with such a high R naught. And I think it's going to require uh, lots of vaccination mandates, lots of ongoing vaccination. Uh, it's not just a one wave of vaccination. There's new generations happening. I think about, you know, how many years we continue vaccinating against polio and measles, despite the fact that we don't have the disease. So we need to remember that, that this may become part of our routine immunization scheme going forward for many years until we finally control this. Uh, I think we're going to see uh, eventually levels of population immunity that are going to turn this virus from an, a pandemic to an, to an endemic disease, very much like what happened to the 1918 uh, H1N1 flu that eventually stayed there in the population for long periods of time. And, and I think that that a lot is gonna, is gonna depend on really how our society behaves because at the end of the day, behavior is really important and human behavior is very important. And you're gonna see societies where the virus is, is well controlled, you know, where you know, in the Orient in Japan where all the kids are gonna be in school wearing masks and they're not gonna have outbreaks. And then you're gonna have outbreaks in, States like mine or Tennessee, where you know you have the school districts where kids are not using masks and everything is crazy and there's no mandates and all sorts of things happen. So I think a lot of it is going to depend on local factors and behavior that have little to do with the virus and the host, but it have to do with how transmission happened because of uh, of behavior. And I think the last thing that worries me the most, Bob, is for those of us working in HIV, we saw HIV start as an epidemic in, in our country primarily impacting, you know, uh, you know, well-to-do middle-class gay men. And then the pandemic in our country has become a pandemic primarily of the poor communities and the, uh, the underrepresented communities. And I, I worry that this pandemic is going to do something similar, right? It's going to become an issue of San Francisco and other cities and high, you know, high income individuals, high vaccination. We're going to be doing fine. And, and you're going to see, you know, minority communities, underserved communities, that are gonna be in the front lines, having a lot of disease, a lot of transmission and low vaccination rates. And I think again, health inequities are gonna be a major factor in determining how we end this pandemic and what we do. So by saying that is we need to really focus on, on health equity, not only globally, but locally. And if we don't do that, I think the pandemic is gonna hang around for a lot longer than we actually want. Yeah. Well, thank you both, uh, you know, the breadth of the conversation, everything from virology and immunology to health equity, to behavior, to politics. It's part of what's been so fascinating and challenging about this. There's no one discipline that you need to work. You need all of them to work together. And it's endlessly interesting and, and complicated and, uh, and troubling. And the good news is it will end at some point, as Carlos said, but uh, when and where and how, probably more on the virus's terms than, than ours to decide. So thank you both for uh, taking the time to talk to us today. Thank you all for joining in. Uh, we won't have another one unless something very different happens. Uh, and then we'll have another COVID Grand Rounds on the uh, 9th of September with uh, George Rutherford, Monica Gandhi, and Peter Chin Hung. And, uh, and then we'll go on from there. Uh, thank you to my uh, crack production team. You see them, their names there and stay safe and talk to you soon.